Hello, everyone. So despite what you may have been told, today I'm going to tell you that the scientific laboratory, you know, that sterile space where more or less objective experiments take place, is not actually ever hermetically sealed. And I'm not talking about being hermetically sealed against the escape of human-designed organisms that will get out into native ecosystems and forever ruin and corrupt their evolutionary futures. I'm talking about not being sealed against the social, economic, political, and even creative artistic forces that go into making up any aspect of human culture and activity that the philosopher of science, Bruno Latour, would have us generously know. And so when philosophies like this start to get circulated, I like to think of them most as being storytelling methods for scientific understanding. And I'm a bit of a science storyteller myself. I started out as a biologist, but I was a biologist with lots of problems. My first probably being the reason why I got into science in the first place, which was due to this twisted crush that I had on my high school biology teacher. What up, Mr. Ott? And <laughs> you know what the really cool thing about him was? That he actually, it is not a lie, had a sixth finger. And so he was really biologically inspiring from this kind of mutation, <laughs> flirtation perspective. <laughs> For real. But once I got over that and escaped my ill-equipped, depressing suburban high school laboratory and got into more of the real game in university, I discovered that I had a bigger problem, and that was that I absolutely downright hated the laboratory. I detested being in there, and I had to be there a lot of the time. And so it wasn't the empirical, nitty-gritty investigations of the natural world that ever excited me, but it was moreover the meta-stories of science that would crack my skull open and make me feel excited about exploring the human and non-human biological world around us. And so what I did to try and attack this problem was develop this weird solution where I let all of those priorities that I should have been taking care of, like my lab reports, just fall down the list of importance. And I started bumping up my appetite for writing scripts from interviews that I was doing with scientists and bringing it into the broadcasting studio. This is when I first started my science radio show back in 2005. And I've since let that develop into this fervent adoration for science storytelling and radio. I'm a podcaster, and now I've been doing it in public radio venues. Uh, but I also work in documentary and sometimes make art projects to try and get at these more obscure, alternative ways of exploring science and what it can mean for us. But I'm here today to highlight what I think is a growing crisis that we're faced with right now as we're trying to engage non-specialists to learn and become involved in emerging science, particularly in, er in an era like right now, when most of us are getting social media quick nuggets about how that world is operating. But you know, these quick avenues through which we're being invited to explore don't really allow us that space to explore the nuance and the subtleties and the contradictions that scientific topics have to offer us, as do all human areas of knowledge production, right? And so one part of science that is, I think, particularly afflicted by this, that I've personally become really fascinated by and have been spending some time researching over the last couple of years is synthetic biology. And so synthetic biology can probably most simply be understood as the application of an engineer's mindset and engineering principles into the biological laboratory, wherein people are asking and working with nature to design from the ground up or the top down genetic machines and biological systems that produce useful products for us that we desperately rely on. They might be medicines, vaccines, clean biofuels, but also those products that are tricky to get, rare, perhaps a little bit controversial in how we're getting them. So things like rubber or vanilla or saffron or what have you. So it's essentially the attempt to replace the factory floor with the biological cell as a mode of production, right? Now, we wouldn't have gotten at some, to synthetic biology where we are today if, of course, we didn't have that genetic engineering revolution that occurred in the 1970s. So we're still using a lot of those techniques that we've been developing for decades. But now what's happened is that with the increasing sophistication of bioinformatics and computational science, we're able to develop these projects at larger scale, much more quickly, and at lower cost. And this is creating this influx and paradigm shift in how we are using biotechnology today, but it wasn't always this way. In fact, synthetic biology, the moment when its term was first coined, has this really simplex origin story. 
So this was all the way back in 1905 when the French biologist Stéphane Le Duc found what he believed to be la biologie synthétique when one day in his laboratory when he was mixing up metals and inks, he realized that he was coming up with these structures that had filamentous growth patterns. They were lifelike, they were moving. He saw this thing and naturally he thought it was a fish. Indeed it's not, it's a blob of chemicals. But remember this was way <laughs> before we had discovered DNA and knew that it was an integral component to living systems, so he couldn't have known better. Right now, we understand that this phenomenon was driven by osmotic pressure, and we now understand synthetic biology to be something altogether quite different. So this is a crude categorization, but there are kind of three approaches to doing this in the lab today. The first would be genetic devices, and this is when synthetic biologists work with standardized, components of genetic uh, sequences that they can splice together in a formation that kind of mimics Lego bricks when you're trying to build a structure in order to intentionally design a simple organism to do something like maybe turn a different color in the presence of a toxin or produce a different smell. Now there's also whole genome engineering. This you may have heard about in 2010 when Craig Venter created the so-called first organism on Earth to have a computer as a parent. And what happened back in that experiment and that what other people are doing now is writing entire genomes from scratch in something akin to a word processor. And then you send that word process document to a DNA synthesizer. And a DNA synthesizer is essentially just a printer for genetic sequences. But whereas our more familiar printers would have ink in their cartridges, these printers' cartridges are filled with adenine, cytosine, thymine, and guanine, the four nucleotide bases that are required to make genetic material once you match it up with a sugar phosphate backbone. You stitch together the pieces and voila, you've got a genome. Then we've also got protocells. This is this totally alternative from the first two approaches to synthetic biology that really aims to get at what makes life tick. What simple basic building blocks do we need from the ground up to make a system that will be at least lifelike, if even lacking DNA. And so synthetic biology has been touted as our big fix to sustainability issues that we're faced with for the future. There's a lot of hope put into the promise that it gives us for getting over this environmental Armageddon that we're faced with as a, res as a result of our super industrialized lifestyles that we've led for too long. But as activist organizations raise, there's also the issue of the big grab that we might be faced with with it, which is that synthetic organisms, unless you're using completely photosynthetic ones, which not everyone is, which can generate their own energy from the sun, they need to eat something too, because they're alive like you and me. And so where do they eat? They eat biomass that needs to be harvested at large industrial scale. Now this can be grown at home, but often the places look to to cultivate this kind of materials in the global south, where so-called marginal lands will be up for grabs, and corporate control from companies who want it to feed organisms when in fact perhaps local and indigenous communities have been living there for a very long time and need to also have the precious resources like nutrient-rich soil and water that are on that terrain. But it's not black and white. My issue with the way that we're covering synthetic biology in activist circles and mainstream media is that it's not the best thing ever or the worst thing ever. It's actually quite subtle and there's a lot of gray zones in between and depending on how we enter through it, we have a lot of creative control over which direction we will head in. And so, the good bad binary, I mean, it gets to be a little bit boring, article after article that you pick up to learn about the science, wherein people like George Church, a prominent synthetic biologist at Harvard University, is either being framed as the one solution to all of our future problems around sustainability with his technologies that he's working on, or on the flip side of that, someone full of so much hubris that believes he is God. And so he's tinkering with DNA, sure, but this is something that we've been doing for a really long time, and there are a variety of creative, critical ways that we can use this. And no doubt it's going to turn some heads for the excitement and like, you know, demise of people's imagination. So something that he has going on in his lab right now is this de-extinction project working around the passenger pigeon. And the passenger pigeon, there's this record made in southern Ontario in the late 1800s where a flock of three and a half billion of these things, beautiful birds, not things, flew overhead in a flock of 
a width of 1.5 kilometers with a length of 500 kilometers, and it took 14 hours for them to pass overhead. Yet, by 1914, the last existing survivor, Martha, in the Cincinnati Zoo, died. There forever after, making the passenger pigeon extinct. However, with the increasing sophistication of these computational processing capacities that we're developing with sequencing and synthesizing, pushed forth by curious research in synthetic biology, we might, before too long, have the passenger pigeon back. There's other questionable figures also involved. DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, who's the military industrial technology think tank behind the Pentagon, are looking at how we can best implement synthetic biology for their missions. But there's also folks like NASA who are doing, albeit more um, practical for the moment, terrestrial projects around biofuel production, yet at the same time they're throwing conferences trying to understand how we're going to use synthetic biology in space and for Mars colonization missions. But I want to highlight the fact that it's not only mainstream media or the usual suspects like uh, commercialized industry and governmental labs who are shaping the discourse today on this high profile science as it's becoming more and more of a household name. There's a bunch of people who have come to the table who are saying, hey, hold up, designing life, that's a fascinating topic that we all need to have a stake in and express. And so people are asking not just how are we going to do it well, how might we do it beautifully, how might we do it aesthetically, and how most importantly are we going to do it with critical insight. And so these projects really range in terms of how they function in society. There's no way to categorize the effect that they're having. Some of them are straight up advertisements for a future synthetic era, and some of them verge on being philosophical activism that rearranges the lines of authority of who a synthetic biologist should really actually be. But this is one of the better known um, projects that come from designers Daisy Ginsburg and James King. They worked with a team of young bioengineers who had developed the simple bacterium that in the presence of a biotoxin would change a different color. And so what the designers did was they stepped in and they created a yogurt drink that could hold these bacteria so that when an individual digested it, depending on what was in their tract, those toxins were there. The bacteria would give a visual output in their excrement giving the signal output that you have to go to the doctor before it's too late. Now, there's also this whole fascinating community of bioartists out there. And the range of their projects is far too wide for me to be able to properly go into right now. However, what they generally try to do through the co-option of biotechnology tools and theories in their work is rearticulate life and our possible ways of manipulating it as a matter of concern for all people, not just those of us who feel welcomed into the scientific laboratory. And they do this by performing it in alternative ways, like maybe creating a bacterial incubator inside the sculpture of a ram, or doing it in the street, or at a festival, or in an art gallery. Now, they really change who gets to experience biology, but there are also other people who are more explicitly talking about who gets to do biotechnology. And so since 2008, we've seen this growing cultural phenomenon of the DIY bio community spurring up all over the world. And what these folks are doing are creating open public laboratories to share the knowledge and actual hardware and practical techniques of working with wetware or biology. And so we've got one here in Toronto too. There's an excited, robust community that's growing every week. Uh, and I know just because I'm on the listserv uh, of DIY biologists who are working out of a hack space and getting their feet on the ground in Kensington Market. But we've got other types of homegrown talent too, like Symbiota, who are actually here with us today. And what they are doing is creating web-based, browser-based DNA design tools with an activist, not an activist, I'm sorry, with a DIY bent so that hackers and professional scientists alike can design more elegantly in their synthetic biology experiments. And so I'm not trying to say that just having this chorus of unsuspected voices evolving a high profile technology, or at least the conversation around it, as most of us are starting to learn about it, because obviously most of the world is not comprised of synthetic biologists and we need to start somewhere, that just having them there makes it a better type of science than other fields which don't incorporate that chorus. Because you know, having an artist in a laboratory is not the same as bringing critical vision, they just don't necessarily equate 
And similarly, DIY biology is not necessarily going to be anything more than the fetishization of biology becoming a personalized technology unless these projects hold on to that politics, which has been well established over decades of hard work and ideology creation from other DIY communities throughout other parts of culture. But people are doing that. And what I think is really exciting to talk about is how we all might involve ourselves in the science that we all do have a stake in. And so there's this scholar, Eleanor Powells, and she tells us that synthetic biology forcibly reminds us of this notion of the agora. And that was that democratic space in ancient Greek society where people from all walks of life would come together to discuss matters of concern. And I agree, because of course designing life from the ground up or top down is a matter of concern for all of us because we're all alive and care deeply for living things, human and non-human alike. And particularly me, I'm concerned not only about the science itself, but the narratives through which we get people involved in developing their scientific literacy while we're going at it. Something that I was concerned about was this UK-funded campaign to get young girls interested in science that came out last year. Because, yes, there's a paucity of young girls headed in that direction at the moment, but is the way to do it really to replace the eye in science with a lipstick canister? <laughs> And so today, I think that this hyper-complex area of high-stakes science has actually become wonderfully simplified in some ways by shrinking down in size to the agar plate. And that's just that nutrient-rich bed upon which human-designed organisms and natural organisms living in laboratories need to proliferate in order to sustain their life. And that's also being coupled right now as a creative interface that a variety of different people are getting their hands wet with. And so you too can make a cut in the agar agora if you choose, particularly for a community of people like you at OCAD University who are artists and designers and critical thinkers. I urge you to check it out, websites like this where there are a variety of resources or investigate uh, your local DIY bio chapter or scope out an artist laboratory however it may be. But just be critical when you're looking at headlines, which give you that black and white binary. I mean, there's nothing less at stake here than all of our collective uncertain ecological futures. And that doesn't need to be the super scary topic. Now, I think that what we can do is just try and keep in mind that, of course, we should go about it responsibly, but we should also go about it with a keen enthusiasm for artistic and creative intervention that always highlights that importance of the critical thinking mind that leaves space for us to meddle in that gray zone, in that area of subtlety and nuance that embraces the ever-emerging moving target that in the end of it all always is what makes up life. Thank you. Thank you.